Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Thomas Jefferson, and the focus is Martha, Maria, and Sally. Admittedly, a lot to cover in a single episode, but because the topics are so closely intertwined, I decided to keep it as a single episode. And similar to what I did in the book, there's an addendum of sorts in this episode, because we're going to focus mainly on the things that we know as fact, but in this case of Jefferson's personal life, there's a lot that we, that we don't know, that we have inferences into, give rise to speculation, some analysis, and we'll offer that at the tail end of this episode. But we'll start with Jefferson's personal life, which was admittedly pretty awkward. Jefferson was not good with women initially, and one of the reasons why his love with Rebecca Burwell in the 1760s didn't prosper. But in 1770, he makes the acquaintance of Martha Skelton, a young widow, and they fall for each other. They have a bond of music and then much mutual attraction, and they decide to get married. Jefferson is thrilled. New Year's Day of 1772, they tie the knot in Martha's father's home, John Wales. And at the time, Jefferson said, in every scheme of happiness, she is placed in the foreground of the picture as the principal figure. Take that away, and it is no picture for me. A happy marriage for Thomas Jefferson. But his role in the life of uh, Martha as a wife, not necessarily what we would call a traditional role today, much more traditional perhaps at the time, which was very much behind the scenes. Jefferson was actually quite clear. He expected his wife to support him, never to disagree with him in public, and was very much kept sort of, again, behind the scenes within the household. In fact, a few years later, when Jefferson was in Europe, he wrote an interesting letter to George Washington on, on this topic of women's role in public life. And he was actually aghast at how the French allowed their women to be involved in the courts of uh, discussion and have opinions on politics, sometimes disagreeing with their husbands. And Jefferson writes to Washington that few Americans can possibly understand the desperate state to which things are reduced in this country from the omnipotence of an influence, which fortunately for the happiness of the sex itself, does not endeavor to extend itself to our country beyond the domestic line. In other words, for Thomas Jefferson, the woman's place was largely in the home. In fact, if you think about the phrase, all men are created equal, for those that thought it should have been maybe all men and women are created equal, frankly, the likelihood is that the phrase had never occurred to Thomas Jefferson. Nevertheless, this was a very caring and loving relationship that he had with Martha, but they also had their challenges mostly related to her physical ca uh, capacities and her difficulties that she had with pregnancies. And the fact is she was pregnant a lot. In their 10 years of marriage, she was pregnant six times. And every time was actually a painful challenge, both during the pregnancy and then long recoveries from Martha Jefferson after each, each baby was born, some of which did not make it out of infancy. In fact, only two made it to adulthood. And eventually, this eventually took her life. In 1782, she gives birth for the last time, a daughter named Lucy. She never really recovers. And four months later, Martha Jefferson is dead. Thomas Jefferson is completely distraught. He spends three weeks in his room, six months in deep mourning before he's ready to re-engage with the outside world. This entire world had been crushed with the loss of his wife. But he finally agreed maybe to get out of these doldrums he'll go back into public service, which he had kind of written off at this point. And he decides to rejoin Congress, and Congress quickly actually then sends him off to Europe, where he's headed to France as the new minister to France. And his personal life has an uptick. In 1786, four years after his wife had died, Thomas Jefferson makes the acquaintance of 27-year-old Maria Conway. Jefferson is 43 at the time, and the painter John Trumbull is actually the one who introduced them. Now, Maria uh, Causeway is married to Richard Causeway at the time, and they're visiting France together. They're actually English, and they're over on a vacation of sorts. And Jefferson, though, is smitten with Maria Causeway, and they start spending all waking moments together, regardless of where her husband was at any given moment. They see all of Paris and the surrounding areas together, day after day, fascinated with mutual interest in the gardens and music and artistry, architecture, endless conversation in what was clearly a whirlwind romance. They both had strong feelings for each other. But then Maria Causeway heads back to Europe, or back to England with her husband, and the two begin a correspondence. And Jefferson is not ready to put things away, even though, again, the object of his affection is now far away and again married. 
Jefferson writes one of the most interesting letters he ever pens, and it's called the Head and Heart Letter because this, this is a 4,000-word, 12-page letter that, interestingly enough, you can see in the really meticulous handwriting, Jefferson wrote this left-handed. He had actually broken his wrist in his uh, times with Maria Causeway and was unable to write with his right hand. So somehow he crafted this beautifully written both words and presentation on the page with his left hand, put a lot of time and thought into an argument, a debate between his own head and his own heart about Maria Causeway. Should he pursue this relationship? Should he not? Is it the right thing intellectually to do? Is the right thing emotionally to do? And it's a back and forth that's fascinating to, un, uh, to read because it gives some real insight into the two sides of Thomas Jefferson, his head and his heart. In this letter, he says, their supreme wisdom is supreme folly. This is heart, by the way, talking to head. Their supreme wisdom is supreme folly and they mistake for happiness the mere absence of pain. Had they ever felt the solid pleasure of one generous spasm of the heart, they would exchange it for all the frigid speculations of their lives, which you have been vaunting in such elevated terms. True, this condition is pressing cruelly on me at this moment. I feel more fit for death than life. But when I look back at the pleasures of which it is the consequence, I am conscious they were worth the price I am paying. This is the heart side of things, which actually has the last word in this letter to Maria Causeway. It gets out his passion for romance, the, the idea that this would outweigh the sort of intellectual side of things. A deeply moving love letter from the pen of Thomas Jefferson. But then the relationship, the correspondence, actually sort of fizzles a bit. We don't have a lot of additional activity. A lot of letters continue, but the passion is, is, is largely gone in the relationship, at least in the letters. And the question is, why? What happens to Jefferson's force of passion? Now, some have speculated it was simply that Head won out. Head realized that this was an impractical thing and not going to pursue it anymore, and the heart went off to the side. And that's certainly plausible. Of course, it also has to explain why the heart never reappears then for what folks believe for the rest of Jefferson's life, which has more than 40 years to go. What happens to the heart? And perhaps we have an answer in what happens next in France, 1787. Jefferson had sent for his daughter, Polly, his youngest daughter, after his other daughter, Lucy, the one that uh, was born when Martha died. Well, Lucy just died as well. And again, Jefferson wants his family together. He has his older daughter, Patsy, with him. He wants Polly as well. She comes over and she brings with her a teenage slave, about 14 years old at the time, maybe 15, and her name is Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings was the daughter of John Wales. That may ring, ring a bell is because that's also the father of Martha Jefferson, Jefferson's first wife. So this is the half-sister of Jefferson's wife. And Sally Hemings is three-quarters white, but she's considered a slave. She's three-quarters white because her father was white, and on her mother's side, her, her father was also white. So three-quarters of European descent for Sally Hemings, but she is considered black and considered a slave property of Thomas Jefferson because her mother was black, and that was the rule at the time. Well, a relationship clearly ensues between Jefferson and Sally Hemings in France, in part because pretty clear that she came back to the United States pregnant with Thomas Jefferson's child. Now, why did she come back in the first place? France had outlawed slavery. Sally Hemings could have petitioned to stay in France, be rid of Thomas Jefferson, and had her life on her own, admittedly not in the United States, but in France, but she could have had her freedom. But she decided not to. She and her brother, who was also part of the, the entourage over in Europe working for Jefferson, decide to go back with him to Monticello. So major decision, and a lot think maybe it's because of some sort of agreement or relationship that Jefferson had with Sally Hemings at the time. Well, Sally Hemings' baby dies, as we, as we mentioned, and the question is what really happens next over the next 40 years in Thomas Jefferson's life? Well, we know Sally Hemings was very, very close by. We also know that Sally Hemings had six more children, four of whom survived. Three of them were born when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. One was born before that when he was vice president of the United States. DNA evidence in the late 1990s confirmed that Sally Hemings' youngest child, Easton, a son, 
had a lineage that dates that goes back to the Jefferson clan. Now it didn't pinpoint Thomas Jefferson specifically as the father of Easton Hemings, but it could have only been in about a dozen or so, maybe up to 20 different people in the Jefferson clan could have been the father. Why do we think it was Jefferson? Well, first of all, he was the only one who was at the residence in the window where Sally was getting pregnant each of these six times. I mean, certainly other Jeffersons could have been involved, I guess, with that, with that uh, kind of relationship, but Jefferson was the one who was there all six times. There were other clues on paternity. First of all, he freed the children and he freed almost no slaves in his life, during his life or in his will. Only three others were, were freed in addition to the four children of Sally Hemings. So clearly something was going on there that, that, uh, that motivated him to set these children free. Also an interesting thing about Jefferson was he was a meticulous record keeper meticulous record keeper. He took notes on everything in great detail. And he had a farm book in which he captured the father's name of every slave born in Monticello, except six. The six children of Sally Hemings, the father is left blank. Perhaps something he was trying to hide that was a little close to home. So there were certainly clues. And then we get the DNA evidence linking Sally Hemings' uh, youngest child to the Jefferson clan. And yet we still, in the year 2000, had a pretty extensive scholarly study that remained skeptical that Jefferson was the father. But then the Thomas Jefferson Federation or Foundation finally came out in 2018 with a pretty bold statement that Thomas Jefferson indeed was the father of Sally Hemings' children. The evidence in their mind, both the DNA evidence, the circumstantial evidence was significant enough to, to finally put the qualifiers aside as they say it in their report and conclude that Thomas Jefferson was the father of Sally Hemings' children. Now we could stop the story here and acknowledge that he had fathered these children. He let them go eventually, either during his lifetime or, or in his will. Sally Hemings was not let go in the will, but she was, quote, given her time allowed by Patsy, uh, Je uh, uh, Jefferson's uh, daughter, her own surviving daughter, let Sally Hemings have her freedom after Jefferson had passed. And we could kind of bring the story of Martha, Maria, and Sally to an end. But there is endless speculation on what was this relationship between this founding father, the man of all men are created equal, and this utopian vision of republicanism and individual liberty, anti-slavery. What was his relationship with this woman, Sally Hemings? Well, again, at this point, we really don't know. We have speculation. We have some analysis. And again, as I do in the book and in the addendum, I think some of that is worth pursuing. So let's talk through it. There's really two scenarios. The first scenario is that Jefferson, in fact, had a sexual relationship with Sally Hemings. He fathered the six children, the four of whom survived, and he enslaved his children. He freed them at the age of 21 or in his will. He had virtually no relationship with them. And again, Sally was let to have her freedom by Jefferson's daughter. But the fundamental thing is, in this point of view, is Jefferson, like many other plantation owners in the South in this era, fathered children with their slaves, and in this case, Jefferson enslaved his own children. Let's take another look at that and, and the compatibility of that story with what we know about Jefferson, the founding father. Now, he's a contradiction in many ways. The question is, does this contradiction persist as accepted fact? But let's explore an alternative. This is a less attractive alternative to the, to the common discourse, but let's explore for the moment that they had a very different relationship. That, in fact, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings were in love. And they had essentially a loving, near-married-like relationship for 40 years. What would bring us to this conclusion and all the other sort of circumstantial evidence? Would this fit this theme or would it not? So, the first thing to keep in mind is a, the recent finding that Sally's bedroom was adjacent to Jefferson's bedroom. Now, if it was just a concubine-like relationship, like many have asserted, this would certainly not be necessary. He can call for Sally at any moment. But in this case, we now understand that Sally's room was adjacent to Jefferson's, and when he retired for the evening, then clearly they would have had plenty of time to spend together. They would not have had time or any opportunity to spend time together outside of this sort of back area of the house because this was forbidden love. 
Jefferson, if he was going to have this loving relationship, it is not surprising that he would want to keep it completely secret. It was not consistent with the norms of the day, certainly for a founding father, someone of prominence. And in fact, it's not surprising that Jefferson would try to keep this secret for all of posterity. Nevertheless, we have these other clues. Bedroom being located next to Jefferson's. If he was a loving father, the question is, why would he enslave his children and not free them earlier? Well, think of the alternative. If he freed his children, where would they go? They'd be away from their mother. They'd have, they had no other family. They had no other place to go, and state law would have required them to leave the state, which, in which case they would probably have a much more difficult life outside of slavery at Monticello if they had actually been freed. If the loving father and husband-like relationship with Sally Hemings for this scenario, perhaps it would make a lot more sense to keep them in his home. We know that the children never worked in the fields. They had light duties to take care of in the, around the house. We, we don't have any evidence that Jefferson had any personal relationship with the kids. There's nothing that has come forward in that area. But if you wanted to please Sally, keep the children nearby, freeing them actually would be counter to that model. Another question is, if they had a loving relationship, why didn't Jefferson free Sally in his will? Well, again, if he's trying to sort of perpetuate this secret, the last thing he would do is to highlight things in his will. In fact, when he frees the two children remaining in, in the household, um, we had Madison and Easton. When they're freed in the will, they are specifically referred to as the apprentice of another slave who's being freed. So it sort of tried to, again, deflect any thought that Jefferson was the father is the reason for freeing them. There was this other apprentice-like scenario. Again, if he had freed Sally Hemings, people would not want to know why. If he was trying to perpetuate a secret, wouldn't he be more likely not to free her, but have an agreement with his daughter to let her go, again, have her time, and go off and live with her newly free children, which is exactly what happened? That actually seems even more plausible. Now, we also have the, the instance of Thomas Jefferson allowing two of his children when they got to the age of 21 to simply leave Monticello. Of course, he never did this for any other slaves. In fact, other slaves that escaped were, were sought after, they were caught, they were treated harshly, but Harriet and Beverly were allowed to go. In fact, there's a story from Edmund Bacon, a trusted member of, of Jefferson's work crew. In fact, he was a manager, his business manager for 20 years, and all indications are it was a very close business relationship, where Bacon tells the story that he, at Jefferson's direction, not only allowed Harriet to leave, but helped her get on the stagecoach to Philadelphia and gave her $50. Why would he do this other than some bond that Jefferson had for these children? More than just a slave relationship and the fact that he was their father, but perhaps it was, again, something more than that. Now, Edmund Bacon is a really interesting character in this story because he is the one who is quoted extensively in this book, Jefferson at Monticello. It's a single source from Hamilton Pearson, who ran into Bacon around the time of the Civil War. And this is many, many decades now after Jefferson had died. Uh, Bacon is an elderly gentleman, and he is quoted with a lot of reminiscences in, the, in this book about his experience with Jefferson uh, back at Monticello. And he is the single source in this book to a couple of key stories in the relationship between Jefferson, Sally Hemings, and the children. The first of which is the story where Jefferson agrees not to remarry when Martha passes away. Now, this story, again, comes from Edmund Bacon, and it was one of the reasons why people felt, well, you know, Jefferson agreed to his, his dying wife that he would not remarry, so therefore that's why he has no romantic relationship after Martha or Maria Causeway. Bacon is the source of this story, and he tells it as follows, the house servants, they called servants, but the slaves, have often told my wife that when Mrs. Jefferson died, she told him she could not die happy if she thought her four children were ever to have a stepmother brought in over them. Holding her other hand in his, Mr. Jefferson promised her solemnly that he would never be married again, and he never did. And historians have taken this statement as gospel. And again, you want to take somebody off track, come up with a story to convince people why you never marry again or have any other romantic relationship ever again, this is a very plausible story, right? Well, there's another part of story in this book where Bacon talks about the departure of Harriet Hemings. 
And he says explicitly that he, he offers sort of without prompting that people said he, Jefferson, freed her Harriet. People said he freed her because he was his own daughter. She was not his daughter. She was dot, dot, dot's daughter. That's how it appears in the book, dot, dot, dot's daughter. I know that. I have seen him, the unnamed father, come out of her mother's room many a morning when I went up to Monticello very early. Now, we know this to be false because Bacon didn't start working for Jefferson until several years after Harriet Hemings was born. Now, if we look at these stories together and the veracity of these stories, the single source from this book about Edmund Bacon, is it possible, is it even plausible that Bacon was actually part of Jefferson's ruse, the secrecy of his relationship with Sally Hemings? And he had Bacon, if ever given that opportunity, to tell these couple of stories, specifically that Harriet Hemings was not his child, which again, we now know is fundamentally false. And perhaps telling the story that was only other uttered by slaves to his wife, no other corroboration, that Jefferson agreed at Martha Jefferson's death that he would not remarry. Intriguing elements from the stories from Edmund Bacon. Now, could it have been a loving relationship? This again is a question because frankly, it could have been something in between. There's the sexual predator kind of relationship that some would even call rape between a slave master and his slave, similar to what Jefferson and Sally Hemings had. And then there's this more uh, other diametrically opposed view that they were actually in a loving relationship. But there's a lot of room in between, and maybe, maybe that was it, is that they had a fond relationship, something like that. Well, we have a couple of clues on why that might not be the case. And one of them comes from Annette Gordon-Reed, who's done the best research on all of this in terms of the relationship between Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And she uncovered the diary of John Cock. John Cock was a friend of Jefferson's and in fact was one of his co-founders of the University of Virginia. And not in public writing, but in his diary, he said that Jefferson was keeping a woman as a substitute for a wife. Interesting comment there from this private uh, description from John Cox. Certainly not definitive, but, but interesting. But to me, the most interesting thing in this whole uh, scenario comes back to the head and heart letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Maria Causeway. I encourage you to read this letter. I quote it extensively in the book, but to read the entire letter, one comes away with a man of passion, a romantic, he, a one who's arguing fervently with his intellectual side on the need to explore even painful emotions associated with love. The, not only the blessings of it, but it's even worth it if you go further when the heartbreak sets in, it's still worth pursuing. And we are led to believe that Thomas Jefferson simply turns that off. By the next year, he eliminates it entirely from his being, that he will no longer ever, ever pursue a romantic relationship with anyone ever again. He's only 39 years old at the time. And he's clearly passionately having this flirtatious relationship that's even a little bit more than that with Maria Causeway, and we're led to believe that it just goes away. It certainly is plausible that if you put these other pieces of evidence together, the comment here by Cox, some of the stories and the veracity from Bacon, the other elements of the bedroom next door, the longevity of the relationship, the freeing of the children, eventually Sally being let go, all while trying to keep it a secret. And yet we know this romantic, passionate side of Thomas Jefferson either went in the direction of someone, and it doesn't seem it could be anybody other than Sally Hemings, or it literally went away. If we believe, if you believe that Thomas Jefferson had a loving relationship with Sally Hemings, well, that's relevant to history. And in fact, we may need to relook at the history of Thomas Jefferson and the presidents of the United States. For this was a woman, a black woman, a slave, who had three children sired by Thomas Jefferson during his pregnancy, during his presidency, which was uh, almost a unique event. Only Grover Cleveland's wife, Frances, had a child during his presidency, and Jackie Kennedy had a child during John Kennedy's presidency. Unfortunately, that son, Patrick, didn't survive more than two days. Other than that, there no presidents have had children during their presidencies, except Thomas Jefferson, who had three with Sally Hemings. 
If all of that is true, and if it was a loving relationship, then we have to ask the question. We have to ask whether or not Sally Hemings should be considered the third first lady of the United States. Now that's just speculation, but it's worth thinking about. That is Thomas Jefferson and Martha, Maria, and Sally from the life of Thomas Jefferson. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.